Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Adam Greco, and I'm part of Search Discovery. And this is another webinar in our SDEC, or Search Discovery Education Community Series. For those of you who are new to the SDEC, welcome. Uh, we basically have free educational webinars that happen pretty much weekly. Right now we've had so many that we've been doing um, two a week, but uh, we're gonna try to just do weekly because we know everyone is busy. Uh, we have about 12 topics that we do sessions on. Today's topic is going to be related to uh, search engine optimization. We have about, we actually just passed today 2,500 members in the SDEC, which is great. If you know of other folks that you think would benefit from being part of the SDEC, please send them to our website and uh, have them join. Again, it's free and we're not using any disinformation for sales or marketing, so no reason not to join. Um, during the session today, if you have a technical problem or glitch for any reason, uh, please use the Zoom chat and I will be checking that out to see if I can help you out privately. But if you have a question for Jacob during the session, uh, it's really important that you put it into the Q&A area because that's where we're gonna go to grab all of the questions um, after Jacob is done speaking. So technical questions, use the chat. If it's a question for Jacob, please use the Q&A. Uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to do as we get going. So Jacob, um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and hand it off to you. So thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, today's session is going to be around uh, creating optimized content and more importantly, um, thinking about it from an SEO lens so that you can create content that is actually worthy of ranking well. So. Uh, a little bit about myself before we kind of dive in. So uh, as uh, Adam said, uh, my name is Jacob Stoops. I'm a senior SEO manager at Search Discovery. Um, I've worked in SEO for a little over 14 years and I've worked on just a little bit of everything, uh, ranging from Fortune 100 uh, large enterprise clients to very small clients. I've seen just about uh, everything that there is to see kind of all over the spectrum of SEO. And I also uh, am the founder and co-host of the Page Two podcast, uh, which is going into its third season. And it is a podcast uh, that talks about what the day-to-day -day life of SEOs uh, is really like. So jumping into the normal content process and I'm going to tell you <laughs> uh, why it's why it's wrong uh, and for forgive this initial s section because it's dripping uh, with a little bit of uh, a little bit of sarcasm so please please forgive me but it's a, a little bit of SEO humor so Step one in the normal uh, SEO content process, and I say normal because uh, this is what I see more often than not before we kind of get the, what I'll just call the winning SEO content process uh, implemented or in play. So normally uh, someone has a content idea and it may be based in research, may not, uh, and it, it may be something that has data behind it, or it may not, right? It's just, a, just an, an idea that somebody has come up with, hey, we should create content around this particular subject. Oh, somehow, I, somehow, somehow I've skipped something here. Apologies, I'm having some technical difficulties. It looks like I've flipped my slides somehow. There we go, apologies for that. There we go, sorry, back on track. Uh, okay, so we've, we've created a topic idea. The content has uh, been created and uh, target word counts have been hit and everybody celebrates, right? Keep in mind, no SEO has been involved yet. And then it is brought to the SEO and it is uh, basically postured as, hey, can you optimize this this post can you optimize this particular piece of content uh what keywords should we target uh sometimes this happens before the po point of publishing sometimes it happens afterwards 
Uh, and honestly, this is the part of the, the process that makes uh, SEOs kind of cringe. And it's really, really difficult. And I'll explain why in just a minute. And of course, uh, for those of you that are that are fans of Office Space, are we ranking number one yet? Uh, which some, <laughs> sometimes it can happen, but often SEOs will say, "Look, that is not how this works. It's not at all how this how this works." So, uh, part of this goes into the. Um, the sort of myths or half truths of SEO in terms of how sometimes the expectations and the processes don't always necessarily align to reality. And part of the process uh, that we'll talk about in terms of doing it the right way uh, is baking a little bit of reality into, um, into the process and setting the right expectations. Yes, so there is a process. And we will get to that in just a minute. So can you see where things went wrong? Um, I'm just going to, that is a, a rhetorical question. Uh, all of those steps were wrong. Um, all the way from the, the ideation uh, to the are we ranking yet? Um, and, I, and I don't want to say that having a content idea is, is wrong, um, but if you have a content idea that is not based in, in data or that doesn't have some sort of a metric aligned to why you are creating that piece of content, if you're just creating content for content's sake, um, probably not a great idea. If you don't involve SEOs uh, in the process and SEO is one of your core KPIs and you want to perform well organically, um, probably uh, a, a miss there as well. And then the expectations uh, at the end uh, on, on if you're uh, ranking or going to rank. So points to consider. In qu honestly, questions to, to ask yourself, um, should a content idea get to the publishing stage without data? Um, sometimes they do, um, but most times the answer is probably uh, no. There has to be some, some data points to indicate that it, is worth, uh, that it is worth pursuing a particular piece of content. And then while you're creating that content, do you have a plan? for how that content is going to perform, or are you just writing it and hoping that it's going to perform well? Uh, in the process that we'll get into, um, it kind of takes the hope out of that, and it's a more precise and targeted effort towards e exactly figuring out what you need to produce in order to rank. So, by this point, and those first two steps are really more at the author, um, at the author level or the marketing level. Um, when it, when a piece of content comes to an SEO, especially after it's already been written and we're told to optimize it, um, the reason we say that's not how it works because we don't have a lot of options. So. Once a piece has already been written, it may, it's usually too late. Uh, and our options are, okay, we can stuff some keywords or we can do nothing at all because we all know that uh, as SEOs, stuffing keywords is, is just not what we, what we do. It's not something that should be done. Um, good optimization is not about including the target keyword 20 times in a, in a 100 word article, right? we can attempt to do what I'll call just putting lipstick on a pig, um, which is doing our best to optimize things like page titles, URLs, and metadata, and just doing our best with whatever content is given to us to make it as well optimized as we can within reason. Uh, but really the big option is, um, uh, the, the worst case scenario is, we may have to tell you to rewrite that piece. And that's not something um, that comes up often. And it's not, it's not pushback that um, I, I think content authors receive very often. Uh, and the reason, the reason I say we may have to tell you to rewrite it is because if you're trying to rank for query, let's say um, car insurance quotes, for example, and you've created a piece of content 
and you're already through that entire process and then you give it to the SEO and the content is fundamentally flawed, there's not much an SEO is going to be able to do other than tell you to rewrite it that's going to help your content rank well. And if you rank well, uh, it's by pure coincidence. So um, what does a winning content process look like? Um, the way I usually explain it is that it's about swimming a little bit further upstream and it's about using uh, as much data and as many data points to your advantage uh, as possible. But the, the real magic, and I'll, I'll say this again at the end, the, the, the real magic, if there is even any magic in SEO, and I even hate to, um, to say it that way, because uh, many people think of the, the SEO industry, um, and maybe it has gained uh, uh, a notorious reputation uh, that you can um, sprinkle keywords in at the end, use magic SEO fairy dust, um, and that is just not how it works. But the real magic is going upstream uh, and being involved much further up in the process, not being involved at the end, uh, and being involved from the beginning of the process. So the process we're going to outline has, uh, whereas the previous process was about three steps uh, or four steps, I should say, uh, this process is a little bit more involved and it starts with research. So before any pen is put to paper, there should be a lot of research to back up all of the potential things uh, that you might want to rank for, that you might want to create content for. And my recommendation is that all of this data gets collected and put into some sort of a topic library. Now, in terms of uh, how you can go about uh, collecting this research, there are uh, there are many ways to, to skin a cat. Uh, I would recommend uh, using some really good tools. Sometimes a, a carpenter is only as good as the tools that they have, so to speak. Um, I like Ahrefs. So that's my personal favorite. I also like to use Google uh, Google's suggestion box uh, when I'm looking at uh, particular queries to look at all of the potential alter alternatives uh, when you start to type in a query. Um, in this uh, in this phase, um, I recommend going very broad in terms of uh, what you might be looking for and casting kind of a wide net. Uh, this is the, the phase where no ideas are bad ideas. Uh, it's all about collecting data and collecting research. Um, I would recommend looking at your competition. Uh, I always say content gaps are really, really good opportunities because those represent areas where your competitors are already ranking and you're not. So adding those into your research could represent some pretty low hanging fruit. Uh, and then I like to use Google Sheets to store my research, um, partially because of the collaborative nature of uh, the Google platform, uh, where you can, it doesn't just have to be you, it can be multiple people all working on the same research at the same time and plugging in as many ideas as possible. So this is kind of the idea uh, hunter gatherer phase where you're not necessarily creating content yet. Um, you're starting to think about uh, and gather um, what does the content ocean look like, right? If, if it were an ocean, what does it look like? And then once you've gathered everything that you think you can gather for that initial phase, and keep in mind that the initial phase, if you're doing it right over the course of time, that research should be continually happening, right? It should, it should be something that never finishes, that always gets, gets backfilled. You should always be coming up with new content ideas that you can build into your topic library to eventually get to. Um, so once you've started, it is an ongoing thing. But then once you're starting to get into the phase where you're like, okay, I'm ready to start creating uh, it becomes about figuring out here are all of the places that you could fish, so to speak, but then here's where you should fish. Uh, and it is about finding your strategic niche. Uh, and the, the example that I like to give 
on honing your niche is uh, business versus a startup. Uh, businesses being uh, business as a topic being very, very broad. Uh, but what if you're talking specifically about startups? Well, that is a sub niche within business and you may be more qualified to talk specifically about the different aspects of startups uh, and less qualified to talk about business as a, as a whole. Um, and, and that's just, that's just how I like to, to think about it. So you've got this entire ocean and the ocean is a big place, uh, but you might be best suited with your expertise and your authority to fish in a certain area. And that's where you'll catch the best fish. Uh, forgive my fishing analogy. Um, as you're doing this research and as you're building a strategy, I also recommend grouping common queries together. Uh, so you wouldn't write a separate article for car insurance and a separate article for auto insurance. They mean the same, the same thing. So when you run across queries that are um, worded slightly differently, or maybe it's a different way of asking a question, it is okay to group things together uh, and only create one piece of content around maybe eight queries that are all saying the same thing. That is totally okay. Um, of course, being an SEO, uh, search volume is certainly something that we like to sort buy from a prioritization standpoint, um, but I would add also prioritizing not just by search volume, but by relevance and how how well honed in the topic is on your niche. So, of course, business or business ideas is going to have more search volume, uh, but maybe uh, your niche is startups uh, and maybe startup valuation. And that, that might be a great topic for you. It may have less search volume, but it may be more closely aligned to what you are really, really qualified to create a piece of content about. So it has to be a combination of search volume and how qualified are you to talk about it. Uh, and then of course, uh, one of the other things outside of search volume uh, in, in this day and age, um, certain SERP layouts lend themselves better to clicks than other and certain types of uh, search result pages uh, have features that distract from traditional organic. So one KPI that I would recommend pulling in as you're doing your research and beginning to target queries that you might want to rank for would be not just search volume, but looking at search volume and uh, uh, queries that get a high percentage of clicks from that search volume. So a keyword or a, a, a topic that gets a thousand searches, but only 20% of searches get a click uh, is probably a lot less valuable than uh, a query with maybe 500 searches where 80 or 90% of those searches get a click, right? Um, so you just have to, to think about that data as well and not just blindly pursue uh, search volume. Uh, so all of that data, eventually, once you've prioritized everything in your topic calendar, uh, and once you've kind of got a plan in terms of prioritization, well, now, uh, now it comes time to let's set that plan up and let's set that plan to a calendar. And I highly recommend uh, using a calendar. Again, there are multiple ways to create calendars. You can make it look like an actual uh, calendar or it can be something less formatted. I've included a, a link to uh, CoSchedule, which is a great tool, uh, their free calendar template. Uh, the one thing I would recommend here is making sure that you are uh, allowing all stakeholders to contribute to the process. Um, so, in terms of tools, CoSchedule is great uh, for uh, organizing a, a publishing calendar. Trello can work too, uh, or Google Sheets, or a combination of the three. Uh, there are plenty of others, but the important thing here is that you're able to translate all of your research and then your strategy to a discernible process for uh, pushing out that content and publishing that content and not just publishing because that's the end goal, uh, but making sure that everybody who needs to be involved uh, at every step is able to be involved and you can kind of track that process to make sure that you're not missing, uh, missing steps. Uh, and one question that I anticipate getting at the end is how much uh, evergreen content will be mixed in with uh, kind of timely, time sensitive content. And I would say absolutely mix it up. 
Um, not every topic on your calendar has to be an SEO topic. Um, there can be certainly a mix. Uh, and this is probably more prevalent in industries where maybe the SEO content choices are a little bit more boring. Um, but there does have to be a, a balance if organic is, is a KPI and something you're trying to grow with your content. And then, in my opinion, the most important part of the process, and again, this is all before the point of an author putting pen to paper. That's really the important point, um, is that nobody has started writing anything yet. There's a lot of legwork uh, that needs to happen and that should happen. Uh, you're building a, a content strategy, so it has to be well-founded in research and data. And the most important uh, point uh, when it comes to optimizing any individual post, in my opinion, is having a setup where you're creating a, a content brief. And uh, again, I've included, uh, if you get this presentation afterwards, a free link to an example content brief. Um, but basically, this is where you lay out, here's exactly, uh, you being the SEO, exactly what you, the author, need to do in order to actually rank for the query you're trying to rank for. So, of course, as the SEO, you want to make sure that the author is aware of what target keywords you're trying to rank for. So, um, like I said, uh, I, I said it before, um, keywords aren't the only thing that matter and we're not trying to stuff keywords. But as an author, of course, it should be on your mind. You do technically have to mention the keywords you're trying to rank for. It's just part of the process. However, uh, where this process differs when it comes to writing a, writing a brief, is that I highly believe that you should actually go uh, and look at the search results for the thing that you're trying to rank for. And the, the way I think about it is when I, let's say I'm trying to, like I said, rank for um, startup valuation. Uh, and I go to the search results and see who's ranking for startup value, valuation. Uh, those sites are being rewarded for a reason. And your job as an SEO is to figure out what is that reason? Why are they being rewarded? What are they doing? And a lot of times that involves going to the sites that are ranking and reading their articles, looking at what's, what subtopics they are mentioning and gathering all of that information for everybody, say, maybe on page one or two, depends on how much time you have. And pulling all of that information together and then turning it around to say, okay, all right, um, if we were going to write a post about this topic, uh, what would we have to do? What do we have to talk about? What level of depth do we have to go into? Uh, and the example I, I give, and I don't want anybody to focus hard on word count, but if you investigate a, 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 a query and look at all of the people that are ranking and you see that the average word count for sites uh, ranking in the top 10 for, for startup valuation is 5,000 words. Well, if you write a 200 word article, okay, uh, you might get lucky, but chances are you're not going to have a chance. So the, the idea of looking at things like word count, it's just another data point to let you understand what type of depth is Google rewarding for the sites that are ranking well. And that's going to give you information on the level of depth that you need to go into. So doing a lot of this research up front before the author puts pen to paper is really imperative to giving the author kind of a guideline for how they need to how they need to write or what they need to talk about. Uh, because a lot of times when authors uh, who in some cases are disjointed from SEOs and disjointed from the entire process, they're just told, hey, go write about this, uh, go write about startup valuation. And it's on them uh, to use their intuition or to try to figure it out. And if you can lead them in the right direction, um, it's in my opinion, immensely helpful. And many authors uh, and content writers will thank you for it. Uh, I've yet to have a content writer who in the end didn't thank us uh, as, as SEOs for uh, helping to, to guide that, that part of the conversation. So once the brief has been written, now it's time for pen to hit paper. And really what you're looking for is, okay, 
everything that's in the brief uh, is the floor. That's the minimum viable product in terms of if you're trying trying to rank and earn that ranking. That's the minimum viable product uh, that you've got to produce. And then from there, you've got to figure out, okay, how can I take that minimum viable product and do at least that so that I can at least be as good as the people that are already ranking and put your own unique spin on it so that you're not copying other people's content because nobody needs uh, another uh, copy of what's already ranking well. You need to figure out how can you do a little bit of what they're doing and do it better with your own expertise interjected. The other thing that I see a lot is um, people working with content producing organizations where they have an agreement that they create X number of articles per month at 200 words per month and every article or every piece of content that they create is arbitrarily set at a specific word count. Well, if you're trying to rank for different things, different queries might have completely different approaches. Uh, some queries, it might only take 500 words. Some may take 5,000. It really just depends on who's already ranking and what, uh, what the intent of the query is and how much depth you need to go into. And that can vary on a piece by piece basis. Uh, as you're executing, um, I would say like, of course, the focus is on the content, uh, but you should also think about structure. You should also think about how can you link uh, and provide helpful resources either externally or to internal pages on your on your site. Um, how can you interject uh, calls to action, right, because those are important. How can you interject relevant visuals and imagery to support your content so that it's not all just words on paper, right? How can you break it up for your readers? Uh, those are all good things to try to interject into your content. Uh, and then, of course, the, the last round uh, before you hit publish is QA. Uh, and this is, this is the round where, uh, one, I don't recommend skipping it. Uh, you shouldn't just go from execution to publish. There should be a, there should be a spot uh, in a part of the process that's in between where the author says, okay, SEO person, I'm done. And then the SEO person goes and looks at the piece of content that has been produced and the goal here should not be stuffing keywords. It should be, and I'm thinking of this from the SEO person's perspective, looking at the piece of content that the author has cre created and saying, how close to the brief is this piece of content? Does it hit every point that the brief outlined? Or does there need to be something else? And a lot of times um, there might be one or two rounds of feedback, and that is actually a good thing. Uh, feedback is okay as long as the, the end goal is not stuffing more words in, but as long as it's thinking about it from the user perspective and, and thinking about it from a qualitative perspective. And in the end, it's all about creating the best possible piece of content that is also hitting on the things that you need to do to rank well. And then, of course, on-page optimization, those things have to happen. You should optimize your URL, page titles, meta description, um, again, no stuff in keywords, because if you've done the process right, and if you've done your research right, and if the author has followed that research, all of that should be baked in. So there really shouldn't be a need to, to do that. And then uh, the, last, uh, the last point I'll make is that it's not over once you hit publish. Not over at all. Um, so any good piece of, uh, piece of content should not just be SEO content, right? Um, if you're not willing to link to a piece of content after it's been created or you want to stuff it in the foot or you don't want anybody to see it, I would say don't bother producing that piece of content, right? It's not worth it. And I know that there are organizations that, that say, hey, here's the SEO content over here and here's the regular content that we want people to see and they don't want the two to be mixed. The goal here is to create a really good piece of content. And if you're uh, if you're creating this content, you should integrate it. You should integrate it and link by linking to it on your website. You should integrate it into your social media, your email, whatever. Um, you should point people to this really great content. And then not only that, of course, uh, measurement and optimization is really important. Uh, once you hit publish, that doesn't have to be it. That doesn't have to be the end of the story. That's not saying you can't go back and re-update that piece of content. If you, uh, if you write it and, and 
publish it and it doesn't rank well, okay, we'll go back and figure out why. Maybe you need more. Maybe you need to change your approach. Uh, or maybe you've created a piece of content that is supposed to be evergreen, but the, the, the stakes of the game have changed and you need to go back and bring it up to date. That is perfectly okay. And once you create a piece of content, it's not the end. It is a living, breathing thing. So where does this process win? I mean, I feel like I, I pretty much explained it. It's at the beginning. It's not at the end. We don't optimize at the end. It's at the beginning. That's where the magic happens. And what does success look like? Um, well, hopefully it's up and to the right. It's up and to the right uh, increases in rankings that build kind of like a snowball over time. Uh, and of course, the hope is that that translates into traffic and that that translates uh, into conversions or whatever you're trying to get your users to do. Um, a lot of times content strategy can be very high to mid funnel sort of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And then you take that process and repeat it for every individual piece of content uh, and you continue to backfill your research and uh, rinse, repeat and, uh, and grow. So uh, that is the end. Uh, q and I see I've got a lot of comments. Cool. So thank you yeah. so much, Jacob. So we're starting to see questions come in. If anyone out there has questions, now is the time to throw them into the Q&A area and we'll uh, start tackling them. So Jacob, I'll just uh, start uh, shouting some out to you. Um, so Elena asks, uh, could you suggest some KPIs for content creators to add to our GA or Adobe analytics? Well, I mean, I think the obvious ones would be sessions, users, uh, engagement. So things like time on site, average session, uh, duration, page depth. Uh, but then I would also look at um, setting up specific content specific KPIs or maybe even template specific KPIs if there are things, um, specific calls to action within the content that you want to promote, you could create events around that. Um, if there are um, specific parts of your template where maybe the content is over here and then you've got a sign up for an email newsletter, that could be something um, that you would want to track. Uh, but really, I would try to really hone in on what what are you trying to, to get uh, by producing this content and those KPIs outside of your basic traffic rankings, so on and so forth, would be the most important indicators of success. Because like I said, some content is high funnel uh, and the goal there would be exposure. Some content is very low funnel and the goal would be conversions. So it's really got to be evaluated on a case by case basis. Yeah, and Jacob, one thing I'll add to that is um, I'm sure there's a way to do it in Google, but since I live a little more in the Adobe world, mm -hmm. um, there is a way that you could build an engagement score directly into tools like Adobe and Google Analytics. In Adobe, we do this through a numeric success event where you can actually compare visits that are coming from, you know, SEO or um, versus ones that aren't coming from SEO and then look at what is your kind of engagement per visit. So there's some really cool things that um, I'm more than happy to kind of share uh, if anyone has questions. Um, so next question we have here is instead of estimated clicks as another metric to search volume, um, I've used estimated traffic in the past. What are your thoughts on this? I think that's by basically saying the same thing um, to me, estimated clicks and estimated traffic are kind of the same, same thing. Maybe I'm just not understanding the, the question, but it seems the same and it seems fine. Seems fine. Okay. Uh, the next, next one I have is, uh, is SEM rush a good tool for query content research process? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are lots of tools out there. Um, and, it, and in my opinion, they all have um, semi decent data, not all of them, but the, the top ones have semi decent data. And I would say Google is more and more in their own native tools, restricting the data or overstating it. So these, uh, these third party tools are now tending to be mm, the better the better source of of truth if you're having to pick i guess if you if you know what i mean so my personal preference is ahrefs but scm rush is a, is a solid tool as well okay uh, next one uh, 
What's a good content plan for an e-commerce site? Would it be different for a telecom uh, major site having um, an online order option? Yeah, so what we often look at with e-commerce sites um, outside of uh, technical stuff would be how well are you um, optimizing your category pages? Uh, how well are you optimizing your site's navigation? Do you have all of the pages um, in terms of uh, all of the products that you have to merchandise? Do you have a category that speaks to all of those products? And is, is that category or subcategory pages, is it easy to find um, on your website? Uh, not only that, but if you're in an industry where there are a lot of supporting topics, um, or if, if there are things you can do to push to your, to your category pages and point people there where you can solve questions or answer, answer questions, um, that would be what I would, what I would focus on. But really with, with e-commerce, um, you're focusing a lot on category optimization and you're focusing a lot on technical PD, uh, product detail page optimization, although you can't control the content as much there. Okay, um, next one. Uh, uh, what if a URL isn't optimized for a repurposed post? Do you recommend a permanent redirect to the new URL? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, if you think you can optimize a particular post better, um, you can certainly set up a new piece of content and uh, in, institute a redirect. Uh, the thing that I would look out for there would be, um, do you have um, any pages on your website pointing to that old version of the page? If so, you're going to want to switch that. And if, you, if, you, if that old page has a lot of links externally, um, I would just be careful to do that because you can lose some, some equity in the transition. Um, but I would go out and try to reclaim and update those links if you have time. Okay, um, next one. Wendy asks, if the competition has 2,000 words articles and you can't come up with extra content because everything is already said, what should you focus on? Well, I would certainly not say create content for the sake of creating content. If, if you feel like everything has already been said, um, well, maybe the focus shouldn't necessarily be on creating more words. Maybe it be, could be uh, focused on how can you uh, provide supplementary assets within the content, uh, anything that's going to help the user. How can you um, push maybe more links to the content? Uh, how can you promote the content better? Um, is there anything that you can do to refine your content um, to maybe answer the questions more succinctly? Um, it really depends. Uh, it really depends. But I think the ultimate answer is um, if you don't think that you have 2,000 words to say and everybody else, uh, the average, uh, the average um, word count is 2,000, well, I, I think that just is what it is. And you should just try to do a better job uh, than they are of uh, answering whatever the, the intent of the query is. However, one thing I would say is it may be that you need more competitive research as well. Um, it may be that you need to go back and look at what are they doing? Wh why are they using so many words? Are they mentioning any other subtopics? Um, is there something that you're missing that could be of value to your users? Okay, uh, the next question is a um, Hrefs your preferred tool for determining which searches drive the highest percent of clicks. Yeah, I mean, that's probably my favorite tool on the market. There are plenty of other tools, but that's my personal favorite. Then Jessica asks, uh, speaking of URLs, is it better to build um, how to content in a learning center or should they be embedded into the folder structure for breadcrumbs? And she gave an example here. It depends. Um, I like both approaches. Um, uh, I would love a breadcrumb sort of approach and I think they're kind of different, right? That is a, a question of uh, a breadcrumb, which is just a tertiary link structure to where 
in a website, should I actually put the content? Uh, and I would say put the content in the place where it makes the most sense for the content to be and make sure that that content is easy for your users to find should they need to find it. Okay, uh, we got a couple questions from Fernando. Um, first one, what would be a good content strategy for an e-commerce category and product detail pages specifically? Um, well, e-commerce one is making sure that you're uh, a cat or a category page, making sure that you're merchandising that category page uh, appropriately. That's the most important thing because you're trying to get people to buy products. Um, copy blocks. Um, I hate to put them at the bottom, but sometimes you're forced to do that. If you can have a copy block somewhere on the page that can contextually um, add value to the page. Uh, I would recommend that. We've seen that work. Um, of course, heading tags, if, if there is a way to customize your page heading outside of the uh, traditional, it is what the category name is, that, that is certainly helpful. Um, optimizing your metadata. Uh, and then not only that, but looking for opportunities. And again, this isn't really a content strategy per se, but looking for opportunities from other pages to link into that category page. Um, on the PDP page, uh, it is about uh, providing the most valuable product description that you can, providing uh, product images, product reviews, uh, and really, and again, it all depends on the product, but going into depth about the particulars of a specific product and really focusing on what does a consumer uh, need to know about this product in order to purchase it. Cool. Uh, Wendy asks, on what platform should you promote your SEO content? Um, any platform that you feel comfortable with, right? Uh, I, I would say social media, uh, email is, is a great platform. Um, your your blog your blog your blog um, it, it really just depends on what platforms are most relevant for your audience. If it's Facebook, uh, go promote it on Facebook. If you've got a big email distribution list, well, plug it into into there. Um, if if you've got a big following on Twitter, if you're into TikTok, if you're into Instagram, um, these are all potential options for promoting it. If it's YouTube, uh, go. Uh, if you've built a, a digital uh, a digital asset that can go on YouTube, go put it there. Okay, uh, one more question. I know there are hundreds of SEO indicators for Google. Are there any that you think are immediate wins? You're talking about ranking factors. Um, I mean, it's really hard to say. It really, I hate to say it depends, um, but that is a, uh, an incredibly, incredibly broad question that is incredibly difficult to answer. Um, but I would say, like, if I had to pick any one factor, it's really just making sure that whatever content you're producing, uh, that it's really, really relevant to the types of queries that people search for and that you're doing what you need to do in order to rank well. Okay, so one last question. Instead of estimated clicks as another metric to search volume, I've yeah. used estimated traffic in the past. And yeah, I think we've, already answered, think we've already answered this one. We got that one? Okay. They're basically cool. the same thing. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, we are just at time, so perfect timing. So, Jacob, thank you so much for presenting and for answering everyone's questions. Everyone else, thank you so much for joining. Uh, there will be a recording of this session in the SDEC Slack group. If um, you have other coworkers that you think would benefit from this or any of the other past sessions we've done, all the recordings are in our SDEC Slack group. And if you join the SDEC, you have access to all of them. So if you have any questions or for some reason you have a problem getting into the SDEC Slack group, please email me at SDEC at searchdiscovery.com and I will help get you all sorted out. So thank you so much and everyone have a great week and Jacob, thank you again. Thank you.